Hi guys, welcome to the crash course of the OMFS DCT Survival Guide. Um, my name is Shona Garland and I'm one of the second degree medical students. Um, just going into my final year, um, I'm going to be taking the talk on analgesia today. Um, so we'll have a little look at our aims and objectives. So we're going to be looking at um, being able to understand and apply the analgesia prescribing ladder. Um, and we're also going to be aware of the common pitfalls and crunch indications of when prescribing analgesia in maxillofacial patients. So starting off with case one, you're the daytime DCT or SHO. Patricia, a 59 year old female, was admitted four weeks ago for excision of an SCC of her right buccal mucosa. And she had this reconstructed with a radial uh, free flap. She's awaiting physiotherapy and occupational therapy before she could be discharged but she was deemed fit, medi medically fit for discharge five days ago. The nursing staff have asked you to see the patient because she's complaining of abdominal pain and has vomited. She has a past medical history of hypertension. Socially, she smokes 10 a day and has, a pa and has pack years of 45 years. She doesn't drink any alcohol. She's a primary school teacher and lives with her husband and her two children. So you want to be thinking uh, what you're going to ask the nursing staff to get you. Um, so maybe an idea to get them to ask for a fresh, fresh sort of observations. Um, and you want to know what the vomit looks like um, and if the patient has any other symptoms other than the abdominal pain. Um, and is there something you want to think about which could be causing the abdominal pain? You may want to ask the nursing staff if they're able to get bloods, if none have already been done in the morning. Um, you may also want to ask the staff to get uh, the nursing staff to get your blood glucose just before you're making your way over to seeing the patient. So looking at the patient's observations, so she has an oxygen saturation of 98% on room air. She's got a respiratory rate of 16, a temperature of 37.4, a heart rate of 109, and a blood pressure of 128 over 95. Now for the most part, these observations are normal, um, but she is tachycardic. Her heart rate is up at 109. Um, her blood pressure is also normal as well, but all we need to remember is this patient has a past medical history of hypertension, so this blood pressure may be abnormal for her, so she may be hypotensive. So looking at the examination, so we're going to do the examination in an ATE fashion. Um, so starting with the airway, the airway is patent and her, the patient's tracheostomy site appears to be healing, so nothing wrong with airway. Moving on to breathing. Um, oxygen saturation is 98% on room air, as we know before. Respiratory is 16, normal, normal chest expansion, and her lungs are here on, clear on auscultation. Um, circulation, um, the patient's tachycardic, 109, but the rhythm is regular. Um, blood pressure is 110 over 95, so that has dropped a little bit. Um, and the patient's temperature is 37.4. Looking at disability, the patient is alert and orientated. The blood glucose is 6.1, which the nurse helpfully got you before, and the pupils are equal and reactive to light. Um, and finally, exposure. The patient is tender in the epigastrium. So this is the area of the abdomen um, just below the sternum. Um, and all the wounds appear to be healing well, and there's no rashes. So... Um, you also get a bit of a history from the patient as well, and they tell you that the abdominal pain started suddenly this morning, and she's just vomited the once, um, and that's went since the pain started. Um, so you also got the bloods which were done this morning, which we will review next. So looking at the bloods, we have a helpful comparison from two days ago and the bloods today. So starting off with the patient's hemoglobin. Two days ago it was 107 and today it's 97, so that is um, a drop. The patient started off anemic, um, but that isn't abnormal in major patients because they tend to lose a reasonable amount of blood during their operations. The CRP is also stable for the patient as well, um, and that's something um, that you would probably expect in a post-op patient. Now the new abnormality, um, looking at these bloods, um, the electrolytes are plumb normal, but looking at the urea, there's been a spike from 5.5 to 11.5, and this is an isolated rise in urea, and this is something which can be concerning. Um, an isolated rise in urea can be a sign of an upper gastrointestinal bleed, 
And that's something to keep in mind and we'll probably need um, investigating. Um, common causes are things like non-steroidals with no gastrointestinal protection. Um, so at this point, it'd be really important to phone the Max Fax Ridge um, and they then ask you to get the patient's cardex up so we can have a little look and see what, the, what medications the patient has been taking. So you get the patient's drug cardex and this is what you see. Regularly, the patient's taking paracetamol, um, they're taking noxparin, they're taking Senna, Lactulose, Amlodipine, Chlorhexine mouthwash, Forticeps, and as required, they're taking oromorphin ibuprofen. Um, now, the important medication here to be aware of is the ibuprofen. Um, and you can see <clears throat> on looking on the chart that the patient's been having the ibuprofen very regularly since admission, but there's no sign of any um, proton pump inhibitor, which would be a gastro in, um, protection. So let's just work our way through the medications. So the paracetamol will be regular for analgesia. The enoxaparin is a low molecular weight heparin, and that is to prevent um, a venous thromboembolism. This asena is a stimulant laxative, and this is to prevent constipation while the patient is taking the opioids, which is oromorph in the as required um, area. Lactulose is also a laxative, um, and that's for the same purpose as the senna. Um, the patient is also on uh, amlodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, which is used for hypertension. They're on chlorhexine mouthwash, which is just to help keep everything clean. Uh, they're on forticeps to help with their nutritional intake. Um, and ibuprofen is also being used for the pain. So looking at this, potentially have discovered the source of the problem. So NSAIDs stand for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They work by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase enzymes COX-1 and COX-2, which are key enzymes involved in inflammation. They also inhibit platelet aggregation, which is why aspirin is very often used in many um, cardiac diseases. Now NSAIDs have a lot of cautions and contraindications. Um, Peptic ulcer disease is an absolute contraindication um, for using, using NSAIDs. Um, and this is because NSAIDs work in two different ways. They cause direct irritation to the gastric mucosa, and they also inhibit prostaglandins, which is, a prote which is protective for the gastric mucosa. And this then causes increased production of gastric acid. So it can cause relapse um, of ulcers and cause upper GI bleeds in pa patients with histories of this. Um, it's also contraindicated in chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injuries. Um, and this is because it can exacerbate an AKI, making the renal function worse. It's because in reducing the prostaglandins, it causes a reduced renal perfusion through the glomerulus and there, therefore the glomerular filtration rate. It's also um, told to have caution for patients in asthma unless diclofenac, diclofenac is absolutely contraindicated. And this is because NSAIDs can induce bronchoconstriction, so it can make the asthma worse. Um, so it's always best guided by the patient. If they can take NSAIDs without any problem, then it's fine. But if they've never really taken them, it's probably not worth, worth, the, um, worth the bother, to be honest. And you also need to have um, caution in cardiac impairment, um, CVAs, coagulation disorders, ischemic heart disease, and in older patients, it's best to just avoid them, excluding aspirin. Um, and this is because it's been shown to increase the risk of heart attacks and strokes. So we've probably established that this patient is probably suffering um, an upper gastrointestinal bleed. So it'd be important to get the medical team involved as soon as possible. It is in a medical emergency that needs prompt recognition and management using the A to E approach. The patients can often be really unwell with upper GI bleeds um, and they may need resuscitation with fluids and sometimes blood transfusions as well. Um, get your senior involved early and contact the medical team as soon as possible.
Um, causes could include ulcers, so ulcers you're looking at um, in the stomach um, or in the duodenum. Cancers could be an example like a stomach cancer. In viruses, um, so you get esophageal viruses, which are a complication of portal hypertension, which is a complication of liver cirrhosis. Um, and they rise in urea, which we spotted earlier on, um, and because you have blood in the stomach and that starts to be digested and that then causes, um, it's then absorbed and the blood has protein in it and that then causes a rise in urea, which is why it's isolated. So what are the signs and symptoms you want to look out for? The patient may be hypotensive, tachycardic, they may have hematemesis, so hematemesis is just vomiting blood, or coffee ground vomit is another classical sign you may hear about, and that will just look like coffee ground, um, and that's partly digested blood. So you may have melina, um, which is again partly digested blood, but this time from the stool, and they may have abdominal pain, and this is typically in the epigastrium. So the patient is then reviewed by the Max Fact Registrar, who confirms they suspect that the patient may have suffered an upper GI bleed. The pa they then contact the MedReg, who suggested some management steps for the patient, as well as reviewing the patient urgently. So what do you think could be potential management steps for this? Um, so you want to think about what could be the cause of the bleed and what might be making it worse. You also, as we already know, want to start off with an AT assessment and resuscitate the patient. And really important to get some bloods at this point. So management. It's important to resuscitate the patient with fluids and a blood transfusion if required. Um, they'll need bloods, including a group and save and clotting, and you want to stop the cause. The ibuprofen needs to be stopped. And you may want to consider stopping the anoxaparin because that may be making the bleeding worse. Management does depend on what the cause is, but in this case, it is likely to be caused by a gastric ulcer. Um, treatment can be with high dose PPIs. Um, this does depend on the cause and this is likely to be led by the medics. Um, and the patient is likely going to need an upper GI endoscopy, also known as a OGD. Um, and this is stop any bleeding which is carried out by the gastroenterologists. So some key points, always be cautious when prescribing NSAIDs. Um, when prescribing an NSAID for any length of time, always co-prescribe a PT PPI. And remember the key signs of an upper GI bleed. And always consider an upper GI bleed when you have an isolated rise in urea. So, moving on to case two. You are again the on-call SHO or DCT over the weekend. Barry is a 20-year-old male who's been admitted with a bilateral fractured mandible following an alleged assault. He's in past medical history of moderately controlled asthma. He takes salbutamol, PRN as required, and clinical moduli. He doesn't have any allergies, smokes 10 a day, bins drinks around three times a week, is currently a politics student, and lives in student accommodation. So again, you're going to be wanting to think about what investigations do you want to be getting for this patient? How are you going to approach, approach um, assessing this patient? And what sort of analgesia do you think would be best prescribed in this particular patient? So we get some observations in A&E. The patient's heart rate is 102. Blood pressure is 135 over 8 to 8. The oxygen saturations are 98% on room air. He has a temperature of 36.8 and a respiratory rate of 15. So what do we think about the observations? Um, the patient is tachycardic and blood pressure is probably a little bit high for someone of this age. So what, what do you think could potentially be causing this? So given the patient has a fractured mandible, it could be pain induced because fracture, fractured mandibles are very painful. Um, and the patient has also been out drinking and that also increases both the heart rate and blood pressure. So it probably is multifactorial and this is something to bear in mind. So next you examine the patient and there is a fracture of the left parasymphysis and the right angle of the mandible. The patient has a deranged occlusion and the fracture is very unstable and mobile. The patient is very tender and refuses to be further examined. Cardiovascularly, respiratory exam and abdominal exam, they're all normal, which have been carried out by A&E, um, helpfully for you.
But of course, what we do next is we're going to look at some investigations. Um, starting off with some bloods. Um, patient has had a full blood count carried out. All relatively normal. Um, no abnormalities. We get some urea and electrolytes. No derangement of the um, sodium or the potassium. And renal function is normal as well. The CRP is raised up in 90, but this would be um, in keeping with the fractured mandible after having this inflammatory process take place. So we're doing a session on analgesia. So here is the WHO analgesia ladder. So you start off at the bottom with non-opioid analgesia, which is paracetamol and plus or minus NSAIDs. You then step up to weak opioid, such as codeine, and also plus or minus a non-opioid analgesia, such as paracetamol or an NSAID. And then you then step up to a strong op opioid, such as morphine, and that would again be plus or minus a non-opioid analgesia. Now, something to bear in mind about the WHO analgesia ladder is it was created for long-standing chronic patients, such as cancer patients. So it wouldn't be appropriate to use this in an acute trauma patient. You can't get start off start off by just giving them some paracetamol and be like, oh, let me know if it's a bit more painful. You're going to start at the top and work your way down as things get less painful. Um, so that's something to bear in mind about the ladder. So now we want to think about what medications are we going to prescribe the patient. So you want to be thinking about what analgesia, what are they going to need for their injury, and are you going to prescribe their regular medications as well? So this is what you're going to start the patient on. 1.2 grams of IV coat moxiclav three times a day, a gram of regular oral paracetamol four times a day, 30 milligrams of codeine phosphate four times a day as required, and then you've got your salbutamol and beclomethazone inhalers, which are the regular medications. Um, now, you may notice we haven't put ibuprofen on. So what do you... We've just been over NSAIDs, so you need to think about why we won't be prescribing this patient an NSAID. They have asthma. Um, so again, you're going to be cautious using NSAIDs in asthmatic patients, so unless you know they don't have an issue taking them. And one other thing you could add to this, you've prescribed the patient codeine. Always co-prescribe a laxative if a patient is on a opioid analgesia. It does bung patients up really badly. Two days later, the patient's still awaiting surgery due to theatre availability. And you are, you're called by a nurse to review the patient as they're complaining of abdominal pain. So you get the registrar to come over and help, who examines the abdomen for you. And they can feel some firmness in the left iliac fossa. So that's just in the lower left quadrant of your abdomen. Um, so you look at the patient's drug cardex as well. And you realise that you forgot to pull prescribe that laxative. Um, and the registrar asks you to, uh, to prescribe a stat dose of Senna and Lactulose as well as regular Senna and Lactulose. As I mentioned before, Senna is a stimulant laxative and Lactulose is an osmotic laxative. They work different ways, work in different ways, and they stimulate the bowels to move. Opioids are substances which work on the opioid receptor in the nervous system. They can come as weak opioids such as codeine and strong opioids such as morphine. And for this reason, it's important not to prescribe both codeine and morphine at the same time. You prescribe one or the other. So we're going to look at some different forms of opioids. So you have codeine, which as mentioned before is a simple opioid. Tramadol is also a simple op opioid. You have morphine sulfate which is a commonly used strong opioid and is very good for severe pain. You have buprenorphine, which is an alternative to morphine, which has a longer duration of action. You have diamorphine, which is heroin. Um, you've got fentanyl, which is commonly used intraoperatively, but this can also be used as patch. Um, you also have methadone, and that's a longer acting opioid, and it's commonly used to prevent withdrawal from heroin. Finally, another example is oxycodone, and this is a similar profile to morphine, but it can be used when you've got severe renal disease. So we've got a drug conversion table here, and we've put four examples of some opioids on. So there's codeine phosphate, there's morphine, there's tramadol, and there's oxycodone. So if you were to prescribe someone 100 milligrams of codeine phosphate orally, 
that would be the equivalent of prescribing the patient 10 milligrams of morphine if it was oral or 5 milligrams if it was IV, subcutaneous or intramuscularly. Tramadol is the same as codeine and oxycodone is 6.6. .6. So this is something to bear in mind. If you're prescribing someone, if you've been asked to change a prescription from an oral morphine to a, a intramuscular or a subcutaneous morphine, you need to half the dose for them to get the same. So this is something to, to keep in mind because it could be really easy to slip up and accidentally prescribe them too much. So some cautions and contraindications for opioids. Contraindications are things like acute respiratory distress, raised intracranial pressure and head injury. Um, this is because opioids cause respiratory depression. It's contraindicated in um, raised intracranial pressure and head injuries because it can make these worse. You need to be careful in liver impairment, kidney impairment, in constipated patients and in the elderly. And it's also be aware that it causes respiratory depression as well as central nervous system depression. Um, in the elderly, it's probably better to reduce the dose um, because it has a bigger effect in them. And in, in overdose, the antidote is naloxone. Moving on to the last and final case, case three. Again, you're the on-call DCT or SHO and you're contacted by a general dental practitioner regarding a 56-year-old female there's a left-sided submandibular swelling associated with a curious lower left seven. You're asked to them, you ask them to send the patient to A&E where you see and assess the patient. So again, you want to be thinking about what investigations do you want to get in this patient? Um, you want to think about, may this, pa might this patient be very unwell? Are they going to need to go to theatre quickly? Who are you going to need to get involved in this patient's care? So the patient comes into A&E and you get a history from them. So the swelling started two days ago, but she has a seven day history of the toothache. She doesn't have any dysphagia, any adenophagia, or any changes to her voice. So no difficulty swallowing, no pain on swallowing, and no changes to her voice. She does have some abdominal tenderness. She has a past medical history of hypothyroidism, hypertension, and gastroesophageal reflux disease. And she is taking levothyroxine, amylodipine, and lansoprazole. She doesn't have any allergies. She smokes 10 cigarettes a day, has 20 units of alcohol a week, and currently works as a hairdresser. And she lives with her husband and two kids. So we get some observations of the patient while she's in AE. So she has an oxygen saturation of 98% on room air. She has a heart rate of 102. Blood pressure of 135 over 91 and a respiratory rate of 17. She has a temperature of 37.3. Now her heart rate is 102, which is a little bit high, so she's tachycardic. So thinking about causes, it could be the start of um, sepsis, but this may also be due to um, pain. Pain causes your heart rate to rise as well. Her blood pressure is a little bit, a little bit high, um, but this may be the normal for a patient. The patient may be a low for the patient. She's on regular amlodipine. We need to think about what the patient's baseline is, and she may be hypotensive. It's important to get all this background information about the patients when you're assessing them. Um, so moving on now, we would want to think about investigations. So you want to think about what investigations you would want to get for this patient. It would obviously be important to get some blood tests for them. So we get some blood tests. We get a full blood count where the patient's white cell count is 14.1, haemoglobin is 115 and the neutrophils are 12.1. Now we know that the white cells and the neutrophils are both high um, and that would be in keeping with um, an infective picture. Um, and that would be in keeping with the patient's clinical presentation of a submandibular abscess. So we look at the patient's liver function tests. Um, the ALT, which is a liver enzyme, is raised up at 150. And the patient's alkaline phosphatase, another, a different liver enzyme, is also raised at 140. The bilirubin is normal um, and the albumin is normal.
So what does this picture show? What it shows is the patient has a significantly raised ALT, which is also known as transaminase, and a minorly raised ALP. And this indicates what we like to call a hepatic picture. If it was the other way around, the ALP was more raised than the ALT, that would be a cholestatic picture. So this would indicate um, a liver injury in the patient. Um, so it would be important to think of potential causes for this patient. Um, you could think about um, hepatitis would be a cause. So it would be important to get a bit more of a history and find out what could potentially have caused this. So what are you going to do next? You have this abnormal blood test um, and as a DCT you're not going to know what to do with deranged liver function tests. So it would be really important to contact a senior colleague. So that's going to be in the first instance your max factor registrar who may then tell you to contact the med reg. Um, but again you got to think what could be potential causes of liver function tests being abnormal and especially in a patient who's been in a lot of pain and um, has a swelling. So you speak to your registrar and they then ask you to take a more detailed history of, uh, of any hepatic disease including family history and what analgesia the patient's been taking. The patient denies any history of liver disease or foreign travel things like that um, and does tell you that over the last few days they've taken around 16 paracetamol tablets per day. You then tell the registrar who then asks you to seek advice from the medics. So paracetamol. Paracetamol is a drug in its own class. It's similar to NSAIDs in that it targets the COX enzymes and it works well as an antipyretic. Its half-life is about 1.9 to two and a half hours and it's metabolized in the liver. The maximum dose is four grams a day, unless you're under 50 kilograms, and then it's two grams a day. You need to be cautious in patients who have liver disease and chronic alcohol intake, and, have, and those who have severe renal impairment. Overdose is the most common cause of acute liver failure in the Western world. And you really need to be cautious in the elderly, especially if they're underweight. If they're under 50 kilograms, you need to be halving the dose and giving them 500 milligrams rather than a gram. Um, and as mentioned, we need to be really careful in patients with liver disease, as this could um, create an acute picture on top of a chronic disease background. So then you want to think about what potential signs and symptoms do you think could a patient present with paracetamol overdose? This patient's already presented with one, so that does give you a bit of a clue. Um, but just think about it. So signs and symptoms of an overdose include abdominal pain, fatigue, so being tired, puritis, so severe, severe itching. They can get muscle and joint aches. Um, they can feel sick and be sick. And they may also have jaundice if it's severe. So looking at the case conclusion and the management of the patient. So you speak to the medical team who advise you to start treatment with acetylcysteine and follow the trust protocol for the treatment. The patient started on IV antibiotics and has the abscess incised and drained under general anaesthetic. The patient recovers well and is sent home. Now depending on when a patient presents after having um, a overdose of paracetamol, you can use activated char charcoal. That's only if, um, if the overdose was acute and the patient presents within an hour of ingestion of the paracetamol tablets. If it's staggered, it needs to be acetylcysteine. Um, acetylcysteine is a treatment of, to uh, of choice, but it does depend on the paracetamol level in the blood and how many tablets the patient's taking. If in doubt, the patient receives treatment. And that is the case concluded. So let's have a look at some resources. So we can have further reading, you can get lots and lots of information on the BNF, um, such as treatment summaries. The on and oral maxillofacial surgery is a great book, you can get lots of information on that. Oske Stop is great for interpreting um, things like bloods, uh, geeky medics, it's got lots of great information, as does Mind to Bleep. And thank you so much for joining us um, for this online session. Um, if you have any questions, please do email.
the email address at the bottom of the screen and um, let us know what you think as well. Give us feedback. We're always happy to help. And thank you so much, guys.